Never deny, never explain, never rush into prince. Let them seek anything they like. Say anything they like. They will turn and make. That doll is in my daughter. Perhaps she'd see me acting in tent shows, dancing in a court, for touring in rose countries. I hope that you've seen the day in comes with the rain. But probably you stayed in probably in the pot and you could change. We actors should surround our every cup of action with pump and navigate the creek. It should be almost as unapproachable as a wild. We should go off to a rich purple crop and come our dress and one inch of escape. We should never let down. We are glorious and earthly people set up above all others because of our genius. Off the path of the way of them and make them laugh and coma. Make them never run a TV play. The word happens when the house lights go up, the mistakes lights go down. We go through grilling all the past today. We're going to walk away to open dime serve Dodie to the island. Further Adia standing on the side door, mingling with people. There's nothing but individuals merged in the common herd. Here is the absolute truth that's the way I feel about my work. It means more to me than anything else in life. I've lived with it since I was 11 years old. Some of it out of interest, but in more ways than one. Sim might and turn into all kinds of experience. The only thing I have in the white all is have with you. Living. My education. My tournaments. It's been my real life and my dream life. Oh, but I advise nobody to try my profession because of the combination of talent, appearance, opportunity, and just sheer luck. Plus always the recurrent agony of disappointment and disillusion is more than I would want an enemy, let alone a friend to bear. The very first time I acted, I was 11 years old. I played Puck in a Midsummer Night's Dream. Oh, I was never the same again. Most girls grow up with their own homes, in their own homes, with their own families. They go to school, they play with other children. And by the time they reach 20 years of age, they decide maybe they'd like to try and become an actress. Well, my home was the tent shows. My play was play acting. And my school was the stage. And by the time I reached 20 years of age, I wasn't just deciding that I wanted to become an actress. Why well, I had been one for nine years. That's not an experience that one can easily wipe out. I am what my life has made me. There's no possible way that I could separate myself from my work. Why well, I would have to amputate it first. Looks as though my work and I are going to be companions for life. I was born in Kansas City, Missouri. Never mind what year. <laughs> While still a child, I, I fell off the fence and I broke my arm. Oh, it mended all right. But it still pains me whenever the weather is damp. And it was damp the whole time that I played Sadie Thompson. When I was about 11, my father had to go to St. Louis, and he took me with him. When we were out walking the streets of the city, a woman approached my father. I was amazed by the clothes she wore. No woman back home had ever dressed like that, and she had rouge on her face. She whispered something to my father, and then saw me and blushed. I'm terribly sorry I didn't see the little girl. She hurried away, and of course, I never saw her again. But I never forgot her. 
Why, but the memory of that woman in St. Louis stayed with me. It wasn't until I decided to play Sadie Thompson that I realized why. Well, later that year, I got to play Puck. And from that moment on, I was an actress. And nothing else mattered to me but the theater. I never cared much about school. So I quit and became a cash girl at the department store. <laughs> my most prized possession was my makeup box. It made me feel like a real actress. After every performance, I would never remove my grease paint and powder because I wanted everyone to know that I was an actress. Some of my friends who also loved the theater would ride with me the streetcar, and I would proclaim in my loudest tone so that no passenger could possibly fail to hear. Oh my goodness, I left the theater in such a hurry, I didn't have time to remove my makeup. To my friends, I would say, one day, I will be the greatest actress in the world, and I will return to Kansas City and play for you. My friends understood. It was the girls who didn't like me. To them, I would say, one day I'll show you. Just wait and see. One day you'll have to stand in line at the box office to buy tickets to see me, and I hope you don't get in. Well, I felt the aid to the wand. So I chose the three Dubinsky brothers. They took plays on the road. If a town had a theater or a town hall, we played there. If not, we pitched a tent. That was our theater. If the railroad was going in our direction from town to town, we traveled by the railroad. If not, by horse and wagon. Oh, all those Midwest towns all had a main street about two to three blocks long before turning back in the country road, and they were all either knee-deep in mud or ankle-deep in dust. We often threw together shows without any rehearsals at all. Some of the plays we put on, Little Lord Fauntleroy, Uncle Tom's Cabin, Romeo and Juliet, and East Lynn. And whenever we got into the next town, we'd always put on a big parade to whet the people's appetite for the show. And of course, I rode right out there at front. What a picture I made at 16 years of age in my sheepskin chaps, flannel shirt, and white sombrero. And I learned to do such stunts as picking up a handkerchief off the ground while riding at full gallop. And behind me rode the men of the company, and behind them the tent hands, all in full cowboy costume and going yip, yip, yip like mad. All Wild West shows were expected to have horses. Well, our poor new company could only afford one, so we'd have to hire the animals when we got into the next town. We had some of the craziest things happen to us. In this one town, we hired nine horses. The show opened, the bugles blared, and the horses romped out. Once again, I sat astride the leading horse. To our amazement, the audience snickered. We tried as we might to put fire into that scene. The audience still snickering. Hmm. Well, of course, the townspeople recognized their own horses, and the horses felt right at home. So they would race. We whipped them. Well, that's when the trouble began. Yells arose from the groundlings, followed by angry gestures. The show fell flat. <clears throat> well, I got my revenge of sorts. Under the cover of night, I led the other members of the company on the nine horses to the next town. Then we saved enough train fare for nine passengers and put the unappreciative horse owners to the trouble of searching for their beasts. Phew. The good old days, huh? Oh, the Dubinskys talked about my future on their circuit. But their circuit wasn't enough for me. Am I to grow old playing the tank towns and warm the Dover plays? Why, I am the greatest actress in the world. And I deserve more than the sticks. After six years, I quit the Dubinskys and went back home to Kansas City. 
of, although it was my ambition to succeed in the drama, I really didn't know where to begin. So I thought I'd better begin at the bottom and work my way up. Oh, the theory was perfect. The way that I put it to practice was funny. I applied for a place in the course of a burlesque show. I started there because I figured that had to be the lowest rung of the theatrical ladder. Well, tried as I might, I couldn't get my foot near that rung. I had to work. Well, I think I had about enough money to keep a canary in birdseed for maybe a week or two. Well, I got a tip that a musical comedy that was opening in Chicago needed a chorus call with a small speaking part. I screwed up the courage, and I went to go see that director. He looked about as happy to see me as if I had walked in with a case of the measles, mumps, and smallpox all rolled up in, into one. His gruff voice said he didn't need anyone, didn't want anyone, and would not have anyone. Well, I was determined to show my talent, not with my head, but with my heels. I managed to do a few dance steps before he made his escape. <laughs> and then I turned a handspring, and that did it. That turned the trick that secured my place at a good theater. We toured, and then came back east till closed. Finally, a chance at New York City. I went to every theater where rehearsals were being held. But no one wanted to hire me as a dramatic actress. Because of my experience, they only saw me as a chorus girl. <laughs> Excuse me, sir, but I'm a dramatic actress, not a chorus girl. I played all the roles that Sarah Bernhardt played. I was the lead lady at 17, and at 18, I played Juliet. I want to act. Well, for the next few years, I took any part I could get, sometimes in a chorus, sometimes in shows that lasted two to three weeks, sometimes seven months. And finally, a bit of hope from, of all people, David Velasco. He called me into his private office next to the Velasco Theater. Entering his apartment is like walking onto a set that had somehow become a home. Darkness and light were the two things that I remember most about the place. The two never seemed to be quite balanced. A room was either dark or, you know, not well lit, but dramatically lit. And I'll never forget the illumination coming through his Tiffany skylight. I began to tell Mr. Belasco all about myself, my past experiences. Those were things that other producers wanted to hear. But David Belasco was not like other producers, as I was to find out. He put his fingers to his lips to silence me, and then with one majestic wave of his hand, ordered me to sit down. He looked me over. Why do you want to become an actress? Oh, I am an actress, Mr. Belasco. And something in me will never let me be anything else. Do you mind telling me about yourself? Sure. I have nothing to hide. I'm played in um, tent shows, in choruses, in wagon shows, and burlesque. I've played all the parts an actress can play. I've stayed outside of theaters all night long in New York City, freezing, soaking wet, waiting to see some man that might be able to give me a part in a chorus. I've gone hungry and ragged. I've also been sick and unable to see a doctor. I have fought all kinds of men, and women too, to work as an actress in New York, and I still have my ambition and my virtue. Well, Mr. Belasco told me of the three Ps, cluck, personality, and perseverance. With the three Ps and a little bit of luck, one may become an actress. He also told me that if I were to work in his theater, 
I would have to say goodbye to love and marriage. Love begets jealousy. Jealousy leads to worry, anger, and the destruction of reason. Those were his words of advice. But I understood what Mr. Belasco said when he told me that no woman of the stage can possibly do her best when she's thinking, right now, he's in another woman's arms. An actress should be as chaste, lonely, and as indifferent as a nun. She should also be as hardworking and as sober if she is to succeed. Oh, Mr. Velasco, I'm, I'm through with love, and marriage means absolutely nothing to me. Unfortunately, Mr. Velasco had no parts for me at that time, but told me he would uh, keep me in mind. Well, it was back to the existence that I had always known. Starvation. I should. George Arliss was doing a play at that time that called for him to carry his leading lady across the stage, night after night. The actress left the show, and, and Arliss was having trouble finding someone to fill her part. Everyone at the audition was either uh, too heavy or too untalented. I got a tip that the part was still open. I sent him a telegram asking for the role. He wired back. How much do you weigh? How much do I weigh? Well, I never knew that talent was measured by the pound, but I immediately replied. How much do you want me to weigh? I hadn't worked in about a year. Wasn't eating very much. So my hunger paid off. I got the part, and nothing meant more to me than George Arliss's approval at rehearsals. The slow flying, a nod of the head, or to hear him say, <laughs> Miss Eagles, you are doing splendidly. George Arliss thought I was so splendid that he asked me to be his leading lady in his next play and the one after that. And more than once, I saw David Velasco in the audience. Why doesn't he send for me? It's almost been two years since he told me that he would keep me in mind. My friends all told me, David Velasco has more stars than he needs. He certainly doesn't need you. Because he did send for me. Miss Jeannie, I have seen you with Arliss, and with a little bit more training, you could become a very good actress, not a star. Stars are not made overnight. How I knew that, Jim. Well, Velasco was staging a four-act play called Daddies. It was about a group of five New York bachelors who adopt war orphans. Needless to say, I got to play one of the immigrant orphans. I got to experience firsthand the renowned Velasco dedication to every detail of the production. Uh, he was a close observer of my acting from the very first reading to opening night. Sure. One afternoon, Mr. David invited me up to his apartment for dinner. Oh, the meal was pleasant enough. But after dinner, oh, and mind you, I heard about Mr. David long ago. He invited me into his bedroom to be his guest as he put it. Oh, he said it all so slyly. I didn't expect it. After a moment, I said no. He glared at me, excused himself, and then went into his bedroom with his four-poster bed and slammed the door. In a moment, my eye was at the keyhole. There he was, rumpling up the sheets and tearing off the cleric's collar that he always wore. Cleric's collar, ha! Well, I wasn't gonna be another one of his plucked blossoms. I threw open the door and demanded that he straighten up the sheets. Ah, he wasn't going to show his next appointment a rumpled bed as proof that Miss Jeannie was as good as she looked. Uh -uh. Only after he straightened his bed and his sheets, I stayed with him until his next appointment arrived. The curtain rose on opening night in Velasco Theater. And in minutes, 
I bound it out as the seasick little orphan girl. That night, I would get my revenge on David Belasco. It was always an opening night tradition for him to stand in the wings, wearing makeup. Oh, what vanity. And then his leading lady would bring him onto stage for him to make a speech. Well, I would play no part in his little game. I saw him there all right, and I took my curtain calls and ignored him. Then finally, when the curtain rang down for the last time, I hurried off to the other side of the stage and back into my dressing room. He bounded it, too furious to speak. I saw his reflection in the mirror. I know what you're going to say, Mr. David, but don't say it now. I really don't feel very well, and as a matter of fact, I'll explain the whole thing to you later on. I'm quite busy. As a matter of fact, I feel very sick. I'm going to faint. Yes, that's it. I think I'm going to faint any minute. <gasps> that's got rid of him. My friends wanted to know, why are you so restless? Why are you constantly in search of another play? You're featured by David Belasco. That should be enough for any actress. No, this is just the beginning. That's not enough for me. Besides, being in Danny's took too much out of me. My sinus condition got worse. I was constantly exhausted. And Belasco continually called for more rehearsals. I also suspect that he met on for that our refusals of his advances or was waiting for the second opportunity. He was always there, leering in the wings. Finally, the dam burst. You can all go to hell. I'm through with the show. I'm through with all of you. I will not be a prostitute to become a star. Gene Eagles doesn't have to. Uh, needless to say, uh, David Belasco let me go. And I never acted for him again. Oh, eventually other roles came my way. But I was eager to work with Sam Harris. Here was a man who was, you know, a newsboy, a steam laundry operator, and yes, cough drop salesman. He even managed a prize fighter in burlesque. That's how he got his start in show business. Imagine, he produced shows with George M. Cohan. And later he and Irving Berlin built a music box theater that staged the wonderful music box reviews. It was his courtesy and integrity that explained my willingness to accept the role that he offered. Shortly after rehearsals began, I began to have second thoughts. Sam was angry. He didn't understand. Sam, it's a wonderful role. It's just not for me. Oh, I'm not trying to trick you by getting out of this. I have nothing else lined up. I shall probably starve until something else comes along. It's just that I'm trying to be honest with you and myself. I can't put myself into this character. If I go through with the role, I won't be very good. I hope you understand, Sam, because there's nothing else that I can do. Almost one year went by, and then Channing Pollock wrote a play called The Fool. He came to me with the uh, script and an offer of $600 a week. And we sat on my sofa and we read the play. And after he finished, I found myself in a quandary I hoped I would never find myself in again. Channing, you can certainly see that I need the money. But I've got to have faith in myself. I've got to believe that if I wait, my chance will come along. I can't afford to compromise myself as I know I will only do my second best. So I turned down the fool and the offer of the $600 a week. Oh yes, there were times when I despaired. Sinned hopeless. Patience. 
And then a few months later, Sam Harris came back to me with another play to read. It had been read and rejected by other actresses. It was in some policy record. I read it. A memory left back at me. The woman in St. Louis, the one with the colorful clothing, approached my father. Now I know why I never forgot her. <clears throat> I read it again. Do I hear rain? So, I'm to be parked here, am I, dearie? I had found something rich and utterly true. I had not yet been in a play that had lived up to my dreams, and I felt as though I would die if I missed the chance to play the role of Sadie Thompson. That woman in St. Louis lived in my life from the moment I saw her. I thought of her constantly through the years that intervened between my girlhood and my fight for recognition as an actress. I was well prepared for the role of Sadie. I know Sadie, and I know what she would say and just how she would say it. Rain is about the salvation of Sadie Thompson, not through the church, but through love. The police raid Honolulu's red light district. Sadie steals aboard a ship for the South Seas and freedom, but an outbreak of cholera traps her on Samoa with Reverend Davidson, a missionary whose whole existence is battling sin, as he sees it. The rain permits no escape from the hotel and the Reverend objects to her playing the gramophone and drinking and dancing with the Marines on the island. Especially the sergeant, the one that Sadie calls handsome. So I'm to be parked here, am I, dearie? Well, now that it's settled where I flop, why don't we all have a shot of hooch? Miss Sadie Thompson, I have come to make you a gift. The most beautiful gift life has to offer you. Do you want to give me something? The time has come for you to make a choice. The broad bosom of our Lord is healing fingers upon your weary eyes. All of these are yours for the asking. Uh, I don't know why I get all this attention from you, Reverend Davidson. I know you mean well, but I think I can worry along just like I've been worrying along all these past several years without your help. Those who are offered the key to salvation but refuse to open the door must be destroyed. Oh, I see what you mean, but I won't get destroyed. I always make out one way or another. If that's all, Reverend Davidson, I think I'm going to go back to my room now. This gift I offer you, what are you going to do about it? Do about it? Well, I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. I can take care of myself. Up or down and jack or broke, what's the odds? Forever night overtakes me, that's my resting place. That's my way. But I thank you for your interest in me, though. Very kind of you. You have kept your own soul in trust, and you have failed. Now it is my business to show you the way to redeem it. What, haven't I anything to say about it? You have one of two paths to choose. What's the second choice? Destruction. And who's going to destruct me? The forces which know no place for evil. And you, what are you going to do about it? Only my duty. Oh, and what might that be? Infectious diseases must be quarantined. Sin must be segregated before it can be stamped out. Oh, no. You went to see the governor about me, didn't you? I don't say you didn't. I got it straight. Some of the boys told me. They didn't know what you said, but they told me to watch out for you. Now I know just what they meant. You were right. I have been to the governor. I shall not let you go, Sadie Thompson. You are an evil woman. You have led an evil life. You have come here to carry infamy to other places. You, you are a harlot from the plague spot of Honolulu. Then you're a liar. 
Look at me. You have told me lies. Oh, Hanson, I just had a run in with Reverend Davidson. And he's not going to let me go my own way, or so he says. And everyone can see that the Reverend's in right, and I'm in the wrong. Then I'm trying to figure out is what the devil Trippie's going to try to use as a scoundrel. Something about that crow that just is a unit is deep. It's creepy. With his eyes, they look right into you. Demon knows just what you're thinking. You're going to meet them friends soon, handsome. From far from home. What are you going to do? Go back to the States? No. There's no way that they can make me go back to the States, is there? Not unless you wanted to. Looky here, if something should go wrong, what do you do? You might as well make plans. What'll I do? Well, that means that you're afraid that something will go wrong. You could go to Sydney. Work's easy to get. Living's cheap. That's where I'm bound as soon as I shed these stripes. What are you going to do there, Hanson? Going to the building business. An old shipmate of mine has a place of his own and needs a partner. These three years he's been after me to get my discharge and come in with him. Ah, I'm glad you're a big handsome. Then your attitude's just fine. Then there's another thing. You go to Sydney now, I'll be sailing in a few weeks. Not that that may mean so much to you, maybe. Thanks so much. Why, handsome? I haven't many friends. And what I could do with just one more. You know, you're an awful funny fellow. I thought I knew all there was to know about men until you came along. How about it? Chanting your up and going to Sydney anywhere? Yeah, why not? They can't stop me from doing that, can they? The devil is strong in you, poor Sadie Thompson. Evil has plagued you for its own. You take care of your own evil, and I'll take care of mine. I know what you want. You want another scalp that you can hand to the Lord. Well, you don't get mine. I am indifferent to the abuse you see fit to heap upon me. Lord, hear my prayer for this lost sister. You Bible bats, don't fool me. Make me over your own way, would you? Well, just try it. Kneel with me, Sadie Thompson. God is waiting. You let go of me! This is your last chance, Sadie Thompson. Kneel with me and pray. You make me laugh! You are doomed, Sadie Thompson. What you fear is the penitentiary. No. Don't send me back there. I swear to you, before God, I'll be a good woman. I'll give all of this up. Is that it, the penitentiary? I was framed, I tell you, but I got away before they caught me. But they'll nab me the moment I get off the ship. And then it's three years for me. Three years. Please, give me just one more chance. Just one more chance. No, you must return in faith of your sins. You've been telling me what's wrong with me. Now I'm going to tell you what's wrong with you. You keep yelling at me to be punished to go back and suffer. Well, how do you know what I've suffered? You don't know. You don't care. You don't even ask, and you call yourself a Christian. I'll Why, you're nothing but a miserable witch burner. That's what you are. And you believe in torture. Oh, you know you're big, and you're strong, and you've got the law on your side, and the power to hang me. All right. But I've got the power to stand here and say to you, hang me, and be damn to you. Oh, Father, you are the judge. Now, these eyes ain't right, you will come. Thy will be to all our religion in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and give us our trespasses, and make me to give those who must cast me at our bed. Leave us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For me, we are two. You have to show us the people. Stop us the take me one green. Then when you do scream, what good did it do you? You haven't any strength left. The cult is miserable. Sadie, you look awful sick. That old sin buster didn't get hold of you, did he? I thought maybe he would have been easier on me that he thought I'd fallen for his line. But he saw through that, too. 
And then I lost my head and I talked to him terribly. But he didn't care. Just asked me to come in here with him as Fred. And I would say, get if you get out of the desk. Please go back to sun. Owls. Outside the rain were coming down straight and heavy. And every single dance he clammed me. You can tread and fear catching at me. And then all of a sudden, I found myself in this big, white, beautiful place. I felt as though all my life I'd been in the fog and I didn't know it. I felt as though I could be steady when I did want to repent. And then it came. I did feel sorry for what I'd been. There was nothing phony about it. I saw myself just as I really was. And I do want to go back to the States and serve out my three years. Sadie, out there, you've got your whole life ahead of you. We'll go away where this damn rain or anything else can't follow us. Just you and me. You'll be Mrs. Tim O'Hara. And I'm taking you whether or not you want to go. No, you mustn't. You mustn't. I'm saved, I tell you. And you're going to send me to hell. What do you want me to do? Well, I don't want you to do anything. Just not say anything more. All right. If you and me never see each other again, I want to say this. I'll never forget you. Never. Is that you, Miss Thompson? What are you up to? It's rain, and I'm thinking about tomorrow. I just put a thing to stand at another moment. I can't seem to do very much by myself, can I? Not yet, maybe. But every prayer will make you stronger. And I hope I'll be strong enough to go through with it all right. You will be strong. There will be no more fear. Hubert. Brady, you will be like one of the daughters of the king. You are one of the daughters of the king. Brady, you I slipped up to him to try to get a seat now, Reverend Davis. Good night. And they stopped. And I'll give it to you. Faith. me all dolled up, huh? Well, I had to look my best, didn't I? Besides, I'm beautiful. I'm radiant. Bet you didn't know that, huh? Sadie, something has happened. Yeah, you're right. Something has happened. You men. You're all alike. Pigs! I wouldn't trust one of you. But the hint is wop. No offense to you in that last remark, old partner. And if your offer still holds, I'm going to go with you to Sydney. You bet it does. Sadie, Davidson's killed himself. No. They found him on a feast this morning, this throat cut. So he killed himself, did he? And I guess I can forgive him. I thought the joke was on me. All on me. But I see that it wasn't. Well, I'm sorry for everybody in the world. Life's a 
equate present for body. It's no doubt about that. Maybe it will be easy and it's simple. New York, New York, November 7th, 1922. The lights of Broadway blaze brighter with the premiere of Rain, a drama of extraordinary grip and significance, of kaleidoscopic characters and chromatic passions. The rain of the tropics, which beats on the roof and drips from the eaves, is at once an irritant and solvent. Rain is strikingly original in theme. True of the Paris Grimation seem to vigorous causes which make the rest of the stiff all the oils of the reality of the character. Oh, it is a new snore tonight. Miss Siegel says some pathos in a Twitter for and it's listed likes and wistful effect of nationalism. And she has from a bone she come to a state. The play rain brought forth emotional demonstration never exceeded with the theater of country and century. The scene with Miss Thompson remorse, her movements of sensuous autonomy, and her sensuous lure and felt. On stage, she has a touch of madden in character. She coins the queen of strange volunteers. As Eagle says, this is how thorough her friendship has been. The main element in great acting is not only fulfilled it, but augurs her own Eagle, an uncaring sense of the play as a whole. Her conscious is fine. And loyalty unflagging to the intention of the author's work is entirely yes, tragic. Entries of seven tops in one stand, with a small display of pure disillusionment and awe, for giving the audience the feel of the real theater. This way, it is cool in some fellow or Polish in this world. On July the seventh, nineteen twenty-two, rain opened on Broadway. Emblazoned across the big marquee in front of the theater were the words, Rain with Jean Eagles. After the final curtain, I walked to the wings. There was a terrific noise coming from out front. The entire house was standing and cheering and applauding. And then the next morning came the reviews, rave reviews. Later, when I drove to the theater, workmen were rearranging the marquee. It now said, Jean Eagles in rain. After one week, rain was sold out for a year and a half, and my weekly salary of $350 jumped with every passing season to finally $3,500 a week. Sam Harris kept pestering me about the need to save my money, not me. When I die, if I have 30 cents, it'll be 30 cents too many. Finally, fame. Rain is in its 19th month with no end in sight. And then along came equity. The Actors Union pressured for an equity closed shop, guaranteed salaries and transportation for actors. Oh, all of the uh, theater managers were opposed to equity. Sam Harris and Mumbin. I mean, equity was fine for chorus girls and extras, but not for creative artists. <laughs> How dare equity come in and close rain? But it did, along with every other play on Broadway. I was not a member of equity, nor did I care to become one. But the unthinkable happened. For the sake of Sam Harris and Versailles, I had to join. I knew that soon that we would be taking Rain on tour. And I wanted to go back home to Kansas City and play there. Though I know that may seem foolish. No one would remember the little girl who'd ride the streetcar with her makeup still on. But how I wanted to stand on the front doorstep one fine morning and say to the old town, hey, look who's here, little Jean Eagles. And she's come back to show you just what she can do. I hope they'd like me. 
Well, I got my chance. We played Kansas City for two weeks, and the whole time I was awash in a sea of familiar faces. It's wonderful. I hope I've pleased them. I've tried so hard. But then you know how I am. I found myself in a position to get married. It had always been the stage first. But along came Ted Coy. He was tall, hats, and we were both very much in love. Ted had once been the hero of the Yale football team, and everybody said he was one of the finest players the game had ever seen. Ted wanted to manage me so that he could say he was working and not living off of me. It was his pride that I wouldn't let him. Besides, no one is ever going to manage me but me. During the, uh, the tour of Rain, Sam Harris kept pestering me about the need for an understudy. There never had been such a person for this role, nor would there be. Sadie Thompson was my part. Sam insisted. You must have an understudy. You cannot play night after night. Look at yourself in the mirror. You're half dead now. There's nothing alive in you but that damn stubborn spirit that won't even give in to common sense. I don't want an understudy. I know that. But you must have one. Besides, if you get sick, we won't be able to fulfill our end of the contract. Fine. I won't go on tonight. What do you think about that? Sam merely left my dressing room. What did I just say? What did I do? Not go on? Not play Sadie Thompson? And the Eagles, curtain in five minutes. I found Sam in the wings. Sam, darling, it's all right. Anything you do is all right. Besides, I could never let you down. And even if I am half dead, I will always be able to play Sadie Thompson. In the four years that I played Sadie all over the country, I only missed 18 performances. Do you have any idea how that rain, rain, rain gets on one's nerves? Half the time my clothes are soaking wet, and all of the time I'm depressed. Have you ever played in the rain night after night after night? Year after year after year? Still, I, I shall be very sorry to say goodbye to Sadie Thompson. It will be nice to play in something where the rain doesn't fall and I can use my own voice. I'm at the hardest point of my career right now. I must show other people that I can play other characters as well as Sadie Thompson. I found the perfect role. Simone and her cardboard lover. Although the rain never fell on Simone, my arm and sinuses acted as though it did. Many a night I, I spoke my line through a swollen throat. A dread dollar seemed to make everything feel better. One night, my throat throbbed so. I didn't think I could get out another line. I panicked. I turned to Leslie. Get me a glass of water didn't understand me. He knew another line had not been written into the script. I beg your pardon. What did you just say? 
Get me a glass of water right away! No, I will not get you a glass of water. Couldn't believe he was doing this. Gathering all of my strength, I turned to Leslie. Very well. I shall get the damn glass of water myself! I walked off to the stage. From that night on, a glass of water was kept for me on the set, for my throat. My throat wasn't even a half of it. I suffered bad kidneys, exhaustion. Then my sinuses were beginning to give my eyesight trouble. But there were all these war parties to go to. With Ted along to hound me about my drinking. I noticed he hadn't cut down his own consumption, though. He felt the need to keep up with me. He wasn't hounding me about my drinking. Then he was hounding me about the upkeep of the home in Westchester or my spending of money which I earned. We divorced. And then, a chance to get away from it all came from the movies. MGM offered me a leading role with John Gilbert in Man, Woman, and a Stone. Stage had always been pure. Me, the stage, and the audience. The screen, there were too many apparatuses. Men who controlled the lights. Men who controlled the cameras. Therefore, controlling the actors. Well, anyway, after the picture, it was back to the tour of her cardboard lover. In every city that we went to, I had to consult a doctor for my throat. It was swollen. I could hardly speak or swallow. All the doctors advised me not to go on, but I did anyway. The Chicago theater manager took great pleasure in my predicament because I had missed performance of the on tour. I showed them. I read that Marilyn Miller had a, a carpet rolled from her dressing room into the streets. I demanded the same. The carpet wasn't one to be rolled out for me. I would not appear on stage the next night. I called just 30 minutes before Kurt to find out if my curtain had been stretched out. It was. The most perfect gift of God is simplicity of soul. But it doesn't come to many of us, though, does it? And you don't retain it for very long. It's the greatest pleasure the Chicago tour ended. But there were still more cities to go to, with more cities. And all I wanted to do was to go back to my hotel room and forget Simone and the tour and the play. Continuing was possible. But the producers complained about me to equity. I couldn't believe it, but they actually sent a representative to find out why I had not been on stage. A man named Mr. Dare. How dare they? <laughs> Well, in my state of exhaustion, I was in no position to see Mr. Dare. He went away, out of satisfied. But not for long. Equity suspended me and called for a hearing. I knew that the suspension meant that I could not work for any producer nor with any other actor who was a member of equity. A 
then the bombshell came. The Council of Actors' Equity found me responsible for the closing of her cardboard lover. Fined me $3,600 and suspended me for one year and a half. Equity. It's an organization for the rank and file. But I don't belong to the rank and file. I'm not one who stands in line to kick as high as the next. A group of actors for whom I have no respect cannot keep me from my public, which I know is a big one. Equity go to hell! Banished from Rome. Well, what the banishment set free? Why? Because I'm sick and I'm desperate and I'm all alone? Why? Because I, I drink too much to forget my illness and my loneliness? What do they care if they've thrown me out? What if they care if I'm all washed up? Well, I'll show them. So I'll return in 18 months. In the meantime, there's always vaudeville in the movies. Enter the irony. I was asked to perform in an actress benefit. Equity's bad. It couldn't keep me from performing in a benefit. And I didn't care if it was to assist equity members. I gave them a little bit of Sadie. Get sick? Never in my life. Oh, I am so healthy, it hurts. Well, now that it's settled where I flop, let's all have a shot of hooch. So wonderful to walk the boards again and hear the wonderful applause. It didn't take long for the movies to seek out my talents. Paramount famous Lasky offered me $200,000 to do three talking pictures. The first one they chose for me was the letter. Everyone loved the letter. So I went, my mother came to New York in the spring to visit. I drove her down Broadway to show her the billboard with my name on it. The biggest toy on Broadway. I owe it to equity. Thank you, equity. I hope you all see it. And then Karen up, picked another theatrical hit for me to perform in. Jealousy. I hated it. And I hated it more as <coughs> shooting progressed with the speed of a glacier. They didn't understand my need to rest. I spent one entire morning rehearsing a scene over and over while carpenters hammered on the set. The bright lights were adjusted and readjusted. I couldn't memorize one lousy line or one piece of action. Everything was becoming a blur. Lights, camera, action. Lights, camera, action. And then the director looked directly at me and said, was Eagles? Lights, camera, lunch. <laughs> lunch. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Nobody 
loves me. Nobody cares about me. Nobody cares if I live or die. And I hate everybody as much as they hate me. I am the world's greatest actress and the greatest failure, and nobody gives a damn. See, now I, I finished the job I was telling And when it was finally released, I saw it. I hated it. Her mouth had cut all of my best scenes. I'm going to write Jesse Lasky a letter. Dear Mr. Lasky, instead of your motto being bigger and better pictures, it should be bigger and better scissors. And I don't care what he thinks. I hate the movies. I want to go back to the stage. Soon Sam Harris will have another hit for me. Paramount released me of my movie contract and I was freeing him. In just a few weeks, my equity suspension will be over. But, uh, my body looks like a war map for all the scars that doctors have made on it. And now it's my eyes. I entered the hospital in September for an operation. It was successful. After I was consigned to a week to a darkened room, and my darkness, I thought about my return to the stage when Equity would have to accept me as its greatest star. Time to time. I visit my doctor for a consultation. Streets is sitting here almost dark. She had been, you know. God, it's like, so we drove across town. We, we passed the Lowe's Lincoln Square Theater where Jealousy was playing. And that's when I, I saw my name on the movie posters when I ran away. The Jealousy was playing. And on us directly across the street was the funeral home where we mob made such a commotion and Valentino was laid out there. As the hospital. Waiting for the doctor. <laughs> 